All right, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And Shana Tova. Shana Tova. <laughs> the first Shabbat of a new year for us. And today is a special Shabbat. It is called Shabbat Shuva, which of course means the Sabbath of returning or repentance. And it's named after the Haftarah for today, which says Shuva Israel, return to the Lord your God with repentance and prayer. Now, traditionally on Shabbat Shuva, tradition has it that on this day, the rabbi preaches long and hard about repentance. Okay, so I hope you guys brought snacks, and drinks, oh, <laughs> and tissues. Here we go. Someone's ready. Your heart is ready. Well done. <laughs> so on this day, we're supposed to preach long and hard about repentance. It reminds me of the story of once upon a time in a synagogue where the rabbi was preaching so long that eventually he had stopped mid midway through his board, his, well, not board, his speech, and uh, decided to apologize to the congregation. He said, I'd like to apologize for this very long sermon I'm giving today, but I forgot my watch at home. And someone in the congregation jumped up and said, but Rabbi, there's a calendar on the wall. I will not hold you here against your will any longer than necessary. But today I want to talk a little bit about Shuva. And uh, you might be thinking, aren't we not, are we not um, beating a dead horse here about Shuva? We've been talking about Shuva nonstop for almost 40 days now. We've gone through the entire month of Elul working on our Shuva, on, on our repentance. What more can we do? Sometimes, let's be honest, we feel like we've hit a wall when it comes to Teshuvah, as if we've done everything we can. But here we stand in what we call the 10 days of awe, the Amim Noraim, these awesome days, where we're supposed to increase our Teshuvah again after we've been doing this already for the last 30 something days. And sometimes it feels like you don't have anything left to re repent of. You've done all the Teshuvah you can up until now. Why is it such a big deal building up to Yom Kippur? I've already done all the hard work. Sometimes you think to yourself that you've done enough Teshuvah already. So today, I want to help you and help myself get through this wall of thinking that we've done enough Teshuvah by sharing with you 10 strategies, 10 step plan, okay? On how to have effective Teshuvah, even when you think that you've done enough Teshuvah already. Because Yom Kippur is coming fast like a freight train and it's going to hit you for six if you are not ready. And don't think you've ever prepared enough for Yom Kippur. You're going to surprise yourself every year when you get there and you confess those sins and all these things inside your spirit start boiling up that you've forgotten about and they don't even give a thought to in the last 40 days. So I'm going to give you guys these 10 strategies uh, for repentance to help you prepare a little bit more for Yom Kippur. And uh, I'm going to do it a bit differently than usual. Instead of standing up here like every week and uh, blurting my heart out to you guys and telling you stories, today I want to read to you guys 10 strategies from this little book. It's from an author that you guys know very well. You'll remember uh, if you take a trip with me down memory lane, when we, before the pandemic, when we used to still have a, the meal inside at shul after every service and we used to chat and chat and chat and bless afterwards and sing, I would always end off by reading you guys one page from a book called Praying with Fire. Remember from Rabbi Heshi Kleinman. So he wrote this book called The Power of Teshuva, an effective day-by-day -day guide, 40 days long, Every morning after I do Shacharit, I learn something from Rabbi Heshek Kleinman about Teshuva. And right in the middle of this book, he's got the section where he gives us 10 strategies where you can, uh, that you need to work on to help you with your Teshuva. So I want to share these with you today. Uh, and it's wonderful because, you know, his writing style is wonderful. He's got stories, he's got anecdotes, and he's got other ways of making you think about things. So this is going to be recorded. So those of you that can't remember all 10 strategies today, first of all, drink some brain medicine. Secondly, it will be available for you guys on our YouTube channel. All of my votes for the whole last, since the pandemic began, all of them are on YouTube every week at the end of Shabbat. I put them up there for you guys to watch. So let's get started. Ready? Yeah. 10 strategies for you to be a new you in the year 5782. Okay. Strategy number one to help you with your Teshuvah. And think about your Teshuvah you've been doing these last 40 days, 30 days. Strategy number one is to make sure that you are going the right way. Here's a story. A fire broke out in a high-rise building, one of these skyscrapers. By the way, today's 9-11, right? Okay, well, sorry for that. Yeah, here's the story, though. A fire broke out in a high-rise building. Take the escape route now, an, officer, uh, an office worker called as he ran past a confused man wandering in the smoke-filled corridor. There's only one way to get out alive. Go now. But where was the escape route? Was it to the left or was it to the right? Which staircase should he have taken? Without knowing precisely what he had to, uh, without knowing precisely what he had to do to escape the fire, 
the man couldn't even benefit from the office worker's advice. On the spiritual level, teshuva is as urgent as an escape from a blazing building. Because teshuva is not a place, is not the place for random efforts in different directions all over the place. It is a place for precise, knowledgeable action. A person who wants to do teshuva must learn the specific escape route that God prepared for us at the very inception of the world. Because God created teshuva before he even created this world. And only by following that exact route can we arrive safely at forgiveness and renewal. Like a powerful medicine capable of defeating a devastating disease, teshuva must contain the right measure of the precise ingredients. So what does that mean for us in our teshuva in these next, uh, next few days, building up the Yom Kippur? It means that we should study the laws of teshuva. Has anyone here ever studied the laws of teshuva? There's a lot of them. So go Google it or ask me to send you a link or send you a, a, a list to read through about the laws of teshuva. Rambam has got a whole section on the laws of teshuva. And this is the escape route. This is the way that teshuva needs to be done. So spend these days learning these things. You know, many of you are already familiar with um, the saying of Rambam. He says that the highest level of teshuva is where the same, uh, the same sin repeats itself. And you have the opportunity to perform the same sin again. And at that stage, you decide not to do the same sin. So I encourage you during this week to try and find the laws of teshuva to make sure that you are going the right way. But in addition to that, what do we know about the right way to do anything towards God? Where will we, where will we find the right way towards God? Yeshua tells us this. We have to recommit ourselves to Yeshua in this time building up the Yom Kippur as well. Because Yeshua says in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you're planning on your petitions of repentance to come to the Father on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, make sure that Yeshua is on your side. Because we've mentioned this in our prayers already on uh, Rosh Hashanah. What did we say about Yeshua? After we blew the shofar for the second time, we said, we, named, we called him the Prince of God's presence. Or the other translation is the Minister of the Face. Meaning that Yeshua is right there in the room with Hashem all the time. We know, right? Our belief is that he sits at the right hand of the Father. Yeshua says he is the only way there. On Rosh Hashanah, we blew the shofar and we asked God to hear the cry of our shofar. And we asked Yeshua to take that cry to God's throne and place it before him. And once again on Yom Kippur, this coming Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to say this again. Remember in the Yom Kippur prayers, we've got that special section about the Messiah in the Kiddushah of our Musaf Amidah, we talk about the Messiah who was pierced for our transgression and he, through his wounds and his stripes, we are healed. So this is uh, step number one, is to make sure that you're going the right way when doing teshuva. So let's make sure this week that we, we learn the laws of teshuva and we understand that teshuva is the way to Hashem. That's step one. Okay, strategy number two, small steps when it comes to teshuva. If Nati had a thousand rand to give to the Daka, should he give the entire sum to one person, me? Or should he give 10 rand to 100 different recipients? You like the latter because you're a tzaddik. The more frequent, smaller donations are preferable because more frequent giving reinforces our self image as givers. Change is not a one-time occasion. It is a process in which each step is valuable. Once change is initiated, it nourishes itself, allowing small changes the potential to snowball into big changes. For example, let's pick someone here. We'll add your names to the story. Let's use Calvin and Burton here. Okay. Um, Burton wants to increase his strength. So what does he do? He buys a 150 pound weight and plans on lifting it as many times as he can each night. But after two repetitions, his muscles ache and he decides to quit. By the third night, he has given up altogether. Calvin, on the other hand, he wishes to grow stronger as well. So what does he do? He buys a 20 pound weight and lifts it 15 times a night for one week. Then he increases to 35. Don't laugh like I had your brother. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Then he increases to 35 repetitions each night. And after that, 
He goes and buys a heavier weight, a 50 pound weight, and steadily works his way up in a matter of months. He's lifting that 150 pound weight with no strain and he hasn't quit or given up. Likewise with us, each repetition of a small victory over our evil inclination. That extra prayer that you don't skip, that sarcastic remark that you don't let out of your tongue after thinking it, each one of these little battles that we fight strengthens our yetzer tov, our good inclination. So it's in the small steps that we approach God. And this is indicated by the Amidah. Because as we pray the Amidah, what do we do before we enter the Amidah? We take three small steps forward. The, these three steps represent the three times that the word Vayigash, which means and he approached, uh, appears in the Tanakh. But you might be asking the question, is God not all around us? Is he not everywhere? Why do we take three small steps closer to God if he is everywhere? The three steps demonstrate our desire to e come even closer unto Hashem. For example, here's a parable. Each year, the king would venture from his palace to observe his subjects in his kingdom. One year, a, a poverty-stricken couple was informed that they would be the beneficiaries of a royal visit. So the husband immediately began repainting and repairing his run-down house. But the wife, however, discouraged his effort, saying, this is how we live. Why put on a false facade? The husband replied, the point is to show the king that we are honored by his visit. So no matter where we are standing during the year, it is to our benefit to take small steps to effective teshuva in anticipation of that great day when the king will come and visit us wherever we are, no matter what our little house looks like. It's not meant to be all or nothing. Every small step towards the Shuvah can help. So that is uh, strategy number two, to take small steps. It's preferable to consistently do small mitzvot than an occasional big, giant, grandiose mitzvah. Setting small goals feeds success and it builds us uh, builds into major changes and thereby Hashem expands the power of our small efforts. Paul tells us the same thing, right? He tells us to run the race. And the race that Paul's talking about is not a 100-meter sprint. It's a 10,000, it's a marathon that Paul's talking about. He says, run the race one small step at a time with perseverance. And how do we do this with perseverance without losing our step, without losing the pace? By keeping your eye on the prize, your focus on the goal. What is the goal that we're aiming towards? It's the messianic era and the redemption. And this is a lesson we learned from this week's parasha as well. Because the parasha for this week is called Vayelech. What does Vayelech mean? Lech lecha? To go or to walk somewhere. Moses, how old was he in this week's parasha? 120, he hit the speed limit. 120, it was his birthday. I hope he got some cake. Manna cake, I guess, is all he could get back then. But uh, it's the day that he died as well. And what does Moses do on his death day? Does he start digging his grave? Does he sit back and say, I am old and withering? No. He goes out to Israel and he forces the Torah to them. He gives them commandments even in this parasha on the very last day of his death. So that is strategy number two. That no matter how many, uh, the, no, don't try and make one big giant leap. It's not a long jump. It's a marathon. Go with the shuva in small steps. Strategy number three. Increase your yiras shemayim. What is yiras shemayim? Fear of God. If the service of every individual, uh, uh, sorry, if the service of God is the purpose of every human being, then fear of God, Yira Shemayim, is the tool that helps us to perform it. Although the word Yira, as it's used in the Torah, is usually translated as fear of God, the Rambam comes along and defines Yira by using the word awe, represents the awe of God. And uh, both of these are legitimate. There are two different levels of Yira Shemayim. For example, the Yira that we define as fear of God, this is the lesser level of the word Yira. And this is the fear of Hashem, punishing us for our sins, kind of like a child who's scared of his parents because he's going to get a hiding for whatever reason. The second greater level of fear of Yira is awe, awe of Hashem. It's associated with recognizing Hashem's greatness, which inspires us then to love him. Because think about it this way. In order to sin, what does a person need to do? He needs to push away his fear of God. You need to tell yourself it's going to be all right. God's not really going to punish me. 
So one of the main reasons why we sin is because we don't have a healthy fear of God. Whether a person is driven by fear of God or awe of God, there can be no teshuva without some aspect of yira. A person who accepts God as the king over every aspect of creation is driven to look for meaning in his life's circumstances. In contradistinction, however, those who believe that their misfortunes are the result of coincidences or bad luck, wrong place, wrong time, they have lost their connection to God. A belief in happenstance stops the shuva in its tracks. So when something bad happens to you, don't think, oh, well, that's too bad. It's Hashem trying to wake you up. It's trying to uh, alert your sense of teshuva. Misfortune can only motiv motivate us towards teshuva if we have Yiras Shemayim, the firm internal knowledge that everything that happens is Hashem's response to our every word and deed. Two weeks ago, we, we stood here at Shul and we learned about the parasha that tells us about the curses and the blessings. Why would Hashem give us curses if he loves us? In order that we return to him. It's the same with the story of the, the matriarchs. Why were all our matriarchs barren? In order that they would pray to Hashem. So when bad things happen to good people, maybe it's Hashem giving us the opportunity to do teshuva. So that is strategy number three, to increase your yiras shemayim. Uh, Yira enables a person to recognize God's hand in the events of his life and thereby motivating him to do teshuva. What do the Proverbs say about fear? Fear is the beginning of wisdom. There you go. Okay, so get scared. Don't keep putting it coming. Strategy number four, make it real. For the younger audience, keep it real, dog. Make it real. Here's a story. <laughs> Two men are walking along train tracks. When the conductor of an oncoming train notices them, he begins to blast a shrill warning whistle. Beep, beep, beep. Both men hear this whistle. One of them is a simple farmer who has never seen a train before in his life. Unaware of what the sound means, he continues walking on the train tracks, enjoying the view, enjoying the sights, and even enjoying the sound of this lovely new whistle. The other person is a city dweller, and he understands that the sound is a warning, and he immediately flees from the oncoming danger. Now, both of these men physically heard the noise of the whistle, or allegorically speaking, heard the sound of the shofar. But only the second one can be said to have probably, uh, to properly heard and understood the message of that noise, understood the message of the shofar, which is leap into action and save your life because your very future is in your hands. So are we like the city dweller or are we like the country boy in our response to the warning whistles that we've been hearing? The month of Elul, the 10 days of awe, Rosh Hashanah and the shofar. The truth is we are a little bit of each. Like the city dweller, we know what we are hearing. The month of Elul, it's Rosh Hashanah, it's the shofar. But like the country boy, however, we do not feel the urgency to swing into action and to do what is necessary to save our very lives. And the reason we, that we are able to know and yet not act is because knowledge in our heads does not have the power to move us to action. This is a very important statement. Knowledge in your head does not have the power to move you to action. Only when the knowledge enters your heart, when it becomes a reality as certain as a train hurling down the tracks, only when it becomes real, do we feel the internal drive to act upon it. Keep it real, dog. In fact, a deeper reading of yira, the word yira that we defined as fear in the previous section, shows us that the Hebrew word uh, discloses, it shares the same root as the word ra'aya. What does ra'aya mean? To see. So in its simpler sense, the word yira, which we defined as fear or awe, actually means seeing the reality of consequences. Seeing that the reason why I'm suffering is because Hashem told me not to do something and he's calling me towards it. The reason why I'm being blessed is because Hashem is uh, taking comfort in me keeping his Torah. So imagine if you could see the germs left on a drinking glass, especially now during a pandemic. No doubt you would be powerfully motivated to scrub that glass down with soap and hot water to avoid contamination. But without the visual evidence though, how do we clean a glass? 
you just rinse it underwater and think it's fine. Because you didn't see what's actually going on over there. Likewise, if we could see the impact of our sins on our souls and the smudge that they leave on our souls, we would waste no time in finding ways to actually do teshuva. But when we don't see it, then it's more difficult to make, motivate ourselves to expend the energy on teshuva. So that's strategy number four. Make it real. Realize that it's not all head knowledge. Teshuva is necessary. The judgment day is coming. The more we make Hashem a reality in our lives, the greater our motivation for teshuva will be. And that's why we have all these traditions, all these symbols that we use throughout these 10 days. The shofar on Rosh Hashanah, all those simanim that we had on the Rosh Hashanah meal, this idea that we have three books that are open, the book of life, the book of death, and the book of the in-betweeners, and judgment is happening, accounting is taking place. Revelations talks about those three books as well. And in fact, if you want to make judgment day real for you, read the book of Revelations. There's one way to try and make this whole idea of teshuva and how important it is real to us in this time. Strategy number five, damage control. Let's change the names here again. Uh, Judah accidentally throws a ball through Mr. Gordon's window. The glass shattered all over the kitchen table where several platters of smoked fish waited to be taken into the dining room. There, Mr. Gordon's guests were seated, ready to celebrate his 70th birthday. The noise of the crashing window frightened the Gordon's daughter, who jerked her hand and spilled her red wine all over the white couch where she was seated. The wine dripped onto the carpet. And poor Mrs. Gordon had to injure her back trying to scrub the stain out of the carpet. When Judah's father called and offered to pay for replacing the window, Mr. Gordon's response was, my window? That doesn't begin to pay for all the damage your son has caused. Now, if the Gordons sued a little Judah's family for the damage done by his, uh, by his ball, it is doubtful whether the judge would be able to actually calculate the total value of that ruined birthday party. Mr. Gordon's pain, the guest's discomfort on the one hand, and Judah's embarrassment on the other hand. That, the cost goes way beyond just the window. So the all-encompassing nature of God's judgment is illustrated in the narrative of the world's first murder. When Cain killed Abel, God inquired of Cain saying, what have you done? The sounds, plural, of your brother's bloods, plural, cry out to me from the ground. The plural form indicates that Cain not only killed his brother, but he also killed all his future potential descendants. A person's value is not assessed only according to what he is at that moment, a person's value encompasses the vast potential in each and every person. No one can accurately assess the ultimate impact of the sins that we cause. For example, one of our famous rabbis, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, when he was lying on his deathbed, his students came to visit him. When he saw his students come in, he began to cry, saying, I have two paths that lie before me. One path leading to Gan Eden, the other path leading down to Gehenna, and I don't know which path I will be taken on. This is why I cry. The saintly Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai didn't even know where he was going after death. So when the saintly Rabbi Yochanan saw his students, he became acutely aware of the vast breadth of his potential liability in his dealings with his students. Not only the students standing before him, but their children their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, even us today as we study the words of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, we could be affected by any mistakes that he might have made. And this is important because the precision of God's justice is something that is simple to understand. Hashem is truth. He is the definition of truth itself. And that is what Moshe Rabbeinu meant when he said, the rock, his works are perfect for all his paths are justice. God's judgment applies to everyone and he punishes all sins, even the potential that your sin has evoked. So that is what we need to be aware of, of strategy number five is damage control. God's justice is precise, taking all contingencies and outcomes into consideration. Even the ripple effects of what your sin has done is your fault. 
But if that is true, teaches us that teshuva, repentance, not only absolve us, absolves us of our transgression, but it also absolves us of any potential effect that that transgression might have had. The guy's getting scared yet. <laughs> Strategy number six, study Musar or some form of spiritual ethics. And uh, Yeshua, in my eyes, he is the master of Musar. The ethics of Messiah are perfect place to go and learn about this. So here's the story. Um, the patient tells his doctor, I know I should exercise, but doctor, I simply can't find the time. Since uh, last week was Rosh Hashanah, and then everyone makes a New Year's uh, resolution to go to the gym. Here's the story. Uh, doctor, I can't find the time to go into exercise. So the doctor replies, your blood pressure is creeping up to dangerous levels. If you don't begin exercising immediately, you're risking a heart attack and a stroke. What happens? The next day, the patient is found in the gym. Doctor scared him into the gym. He decided to go during his lunch hour to make sure that he doesn't end up getting a stroke and a heart attack. Now, like this patient, most of us have a vague idea of what we must do to promote our spiritual health. We know we could do better, learn more Torah, pray with more concentration, give more charity, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is we don't see real improvement as absolutely necessary. Because if it isn't alarming, if it isn't life or death, we think we can just put it off. The truth is, teshuva is life or death. That's what Yom Kippur is about. Life or death in the year ahead. So studying Musar enables us to identify which part of our spiritual anatomy is weak, which part needs to be exercised, how to repair the damage, and the consequences of failing to respond to these weaknesses. In the allegory above, uh, the doctor issues his warning once and the patient goes and institutes change. But most likely in real life, his determination is going to fade away and he will revert back to his old habits. But what if he had to visit that doctor on a daily basis to give a report on his progress? No doubt, then he would adhere to his program with far more seriousness. Musar is analogous to this daily visit to the doctor. It not only awakens a person to the need for teshuva, but it reinvigorates his commitment each day that it is studied. And this is why the, the big kahuna when it comes to Musar, Rav Yisrael Salanta writes that teshuva is impossible without the study of Musar, without looking at your own character traits and working on them. Because halakha teaches us what to do, but Musar inspires us to implement those mitzvot upon our souls. So in the next few days, find a way to study some Musar, some ethics of the spirit. Humble yourself as Yeshua tells us. Uh, can you guys remember any of the things that we study in Musar? Which character traits we have to work on? Chesed, right? So at the end of the day, when you go to bed, we're supposed to do something called Cheshbon Han Nefesh, which means accounting of the soul. You need to sit there in your bed before you go to sleep and work on these character traits. So you take one like Chesed, for example. You think to yourself, in all my interactions today with people around me, how was my degree of Chesed? Give yourself a mark out of 10. Was I 10 out of 10 in showing people chesed? Or was I a horrible, selfish person today? And the next day, work on that. Gratitude. Think about how, gra how, how grateful you were this day. Did you even thank God that you had breath this morning? Or did you just go off to work, come back to bed, and same procedure as last year tomorrow? Did you show any gratitude? Generosity. How many beggars did you drive past today? 10 of them. How many of them did you give something to? Lord or one? Work on your generosity. Your justice and your mercy. How did you judge the people in your workplace today? Did you show them some mercy? Because you should judge others as you want to be judged. And there's a whole list of these things we can work on every single night. Your equanimity, your patience, your silence, your moderation, your faith. Work on your musar during these days to have your uh, repentance more effective. Okay, strategy number seven. Focus on the negative. Here's one you won't hear in a prosperity teaching church. Focus on the negative. Have you ever heard someone tell you to do that? Yeah, listen to this. Uh, let's not use a name for this one. <clears throat> Eli was his own best friend. He forgave himself for every mistake that he made. He believed his own myriad excuses for his failures, his lapses, and his impulse actions. He believed in his own innate goodness 
If only the world would cooperate. He knew that he would be a far better person, more productive person. But what could he do? He was surrounded by difficult people and extenuating circumstances. He did the best he could, he told himself, and that was all that could be expected of him. Does this sound familiar? Especially when I read it in my own voice. This one hits hard. This one hits you right in the fields. Most people are similarly generous in their self-judgment, offering themselves ample excuses for their own misdeeds. The person who is capable of cutting through his justifications, reaching into his own heart and objectively assessing what he finds there, this person has ascended to a level of personal greatness. Because the three words, I have sinned, may be the most difficult words to state in this world with complete sincerity, to actually believe it, to mean it. The way to break through our self-justifications and find the roots of our spiritual challenges is to focus on the negative, to lift all your faulty reasoning that keeps us from doing teshuva, and then to challenge each one with the unvarnished reality of the situation. Try and do that this week. Go write down why you haven't studied more Torah this year. Write down why you haven't done every prayer service this year. All your excuses that you've come up with over the last year. Why life is so difficult. And work on every single one of them. For example, what our mind does is we create a rationale. Like the following. We say something like, Teshuva requires an unhealthy focus on guilt and shame. My therapist says I shouldn't do it. This, for example, is unnecessary for me. For I... And deep down, actually a good person. That's what we say to ourselves, right? The truth, uh, the reality, however, is that the shuva is like a medical imaging test or an x-ray designed to expose your dangerous health conditions. A person might prefer to think of himself as a healthy person, but he has to recognize that he has a problem before he can ever worry about curing it. Do an x-ray on yourself. Or another thing we do, here's another rationale that we lie to ourselves with. We say, to make mistakes is human. It's human to err, right? If God expected perfection, he would have created me perfectly. In reality, the Rambam utterly rejects such moral avoidance. He says, free will is bestowed on every human being. There is no one who can prevent him from doing that which is good or that which is evil. Being only human, as we say, is not a viable excuse for your mistakes. Rather, the opposite of that is exactly true. Being only human means that you are in fact capable of and responsible for making the right moral choice. The Torah urges us to realize that the Teshuvah is not far from you. It's in your mouth, easy to perform. So the Teshuvah process begins in your mouth. You actually have to confess and thereby accept the responsibility or having sinned. That is where the new era, both for ourselves personally and for the world, will begin. So, strategy number seven is to focus on the negative. One cannot begin to correct what is wrong until he looks at himself honestly. What does Yeshua tell us about how we should look at others and ourselves? Sometimes you've got something stuck in our eye. Take out the log in your own eye first before you worry about the splinter in someone else's. That's strategy number seven. Sorry, I forgot my watch. <laughs> oh, the sundial. <laughs> All right, almost done. Strategy number eight. Accept responsibility. Who, me? Okay, here's another rationale we make up for ourselves, right? We say, I can't help it. I was born like this. Maybe I was born this way. I was born with this trait. I was brought up this way. It's the culture around me. It's my neighborhood. Save the city. It's my family that's so horrible. It's my job that makes me so stressed. It's my genes. Genetics, not Japan. I have a bloodline curse. Peter. Yeah, your pants are holy because they're Levi's. So this is the lies we tell ourselves, the rationale we build up in our mind. But in reality, if we transgress one of Hashem's commandments, our first reaction should not be who to blame. Our first reaction should be that of remorse. We should feel remorse for what we have done, combined with an effort to remedy the damage and avoid repeating that sin. 
but it becomes impossible to have remorse unless we feel responsible for what we actually did. If a person believes that circumstances forced his action, then what he's actually doing is he's blaming it on Hashem. Because Hashem is in control of all circumstances in this world. He is the one who sends us these tests. If you're blaming your circumstances, your parents, your family, your city, your environment, the age you're in, you are blaming Hashem and telling him that he doesn't know what he is doing. He is the one who creates all circumstances. A person who blames others relinquishes the power that he has to determine the course of his own life. He allows himself to become a slave of those circumstances. Blown wherever the wind will carry him. However, a person who accepts personal responsibility recognizes the power of choice that God put into his hands and makes an effort to build a good life utilizing that power. So listen to this. Accepting personal responsibility includes the following. Acknowledge that you are solely responsible for the choices in your life. No one else. Accept the fact that you choose your feelings and you choose your thoughts. You allow those thoughts to come into your head. Accept that you choose the direction of your life. You don't go where fate leads you. You go where you choose to go. There's a famous saying in the Talmud about this, that if someone wants to sin, his feet will lead him in that direction. What we think and what we want, our feet will take us there. Realizing that you cannot blame others for the choices that you have made. Realize that you do have the power to determine your reaction to any events or actions directed at you, no matter how negative they seem. Maybe you did get a raw deal, but you still have the power to choose your reaction and your thoughts about how to deal with this raw deal that was sent your way. Refuse to indulge in self-pity, but rather take charge of your life and give it direction and give it reason. Internalize that God equips each person to perfection. You have all the tools you need. He did, if he did not equip you with a certain asset or a certain trait, then don't wish that you had that trait because that trait won't help you in any way. God's given you everything you need in your life for your circumstances and your situation. Take an honest inventory of your strengths, your abilities, your talents, your virtues, and your positive points. Here comes the prosperity teaching. Know what's good in you and concentrate on those things. Develop positive, self-affirming, self-talk scripts. Write down the good things about yourself to enhance your personal development and growth. Keep it in your pocket, right? Or take um, some face cream, L'Oreal, every five minutes because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. Remind yourself of how good you actually can be. Let go of blame and anger held towards people in your past. Realize that they did the best they could considering the limitations of their knowledge. They didn't know what they were doing to you. As horrible as those people might have been. Forgive them and let go of it. You don't know their background, what level of awareness they had, what level of knowledge they had. So that is strategy number eight. Accept your responsibility. It's all you. Without taking responsibility for one's actions, the remorse that leads to Shuvah and change cannot arise. Don't be like Adam and Eve were on the Rosh Hashanah a few days ago. Adam, what did he do? He blamed Eve. Eve, what did she do? She blamed the snake. And as Sandy always says, and the snake didn't have a foot to stand on, eh? We should actually have like an AA meeting for repentance. You must come up here and say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have sinned. And I am a sinner. Here you go. Take responsibility. <laughs> I am a sinner because of <laughs> dot, dot, dot. because of my other AA meeting. That's the problem, you see. <laughs> All right, strategy number nine is to increase your prayer, to pray about Teshuva. Since Teshuva is an internal process, we have to work on it from the inside out, starting with our hearts. Prayer, which originates in the heart, is therefore an ideal tool for elevation. When we pray to Hashem for help in doing teshuva, we demonstrate that being close to God and doing His will are our priorities. That is the feeling that we express when we recite the fifth blessing in the Amidah. We say to God, influence us to return in complete repentance. Because prayer and repentance are driven by the desire 
to come closer to Hashem. When we pray for forgiveness and divine assistance, we are indeed considered to be doing teshuva. And these prayers that are contained in the Amidah are the Shalach Nalu, where we request God for forgiveness, and the very next blessing, the Hashivainu, we ask for the ability to repent. Those are two opportunities that we have every day, three times a day, to perform teshuva. So let's do it. It's available for us. We can stay on track. Oh, listen to this, by the way. And tell me if this sounds familiar to you. We can stay on track by asking Hashem to keep difficult challenges and temptations out of our path. Sound familiar? Rav Chaim Velozen taught his students that prayer could, be, uh, could protect them from encountering such challenges as anger, gossip, looking at improper things and other sins that cross one's path uninvited. He advised his students, pray before there is a misfortune because the Yira Shemayim, the fear of heaven that brings one to pray is what will save the person from that test. The fact that man prays to be saved declares to his creator that he recognizes very well the greatness of the spiritual test that is about to come. So we are not alone in our quest to purify our hearts and bring ourselves closer to Hashem. We can turn to God openly through prayer, passionately, in our own language even, and ask him to free us from self-imposed bonds. We can share our anguish with him regarding our trials and our failures at self-improvement. And by doing so, we acknowledge that only Hashem in his infinite love is the one who can help us. So as Yeshua teaches us, pray the Onsa Father, the Our Father, the Ofinu, where he says, lead us not into temptation. Let us not be overcome by trials. And by doing that proactively, it's already showing our intent when it comes to Teshuvah. And final strategy, strategy number 10, ASAP right now. When should you repent? Right now. When a task perceives, uh, is perceived to be difficult and lies ahead, the common human response is procrastinate. I'll start tomorrow when I'm refreshed, when I feel better, when I've got a good breakfast in, because today's breakfast was horrible, etc., etc., etc. I'll pay next month when I've got money, we say. I'll do better when the children get older and I've got more time. I've got more peace and quiet. Then I'll finally finish reading the parasha, etc., etc. This is a problem when it comes to teshuva, because postponing teshuva has many negative ramifications. By delaying our effort to change, we leave ourselves in a situation of repeating the sin again, which begins to seem less and less of a less like a sin. The more you do a sin, the more common it becomes to you and more like a permissible option. At that point, we might completely lose the impetus to do teshuva of that sin in the first place. How does the impermissible become permissible to us? It ceases to arouse guilt within us. You know, we use a verse in the Bible like once saved, always saved, for example. And we never again in our life feel guilty for a sin. It's a thing that we do. If we no longer feel that we are doing wrong, we no longer feel the need to apologize or to change what we are doing. For example, at congregation Call Pay, which is a made up congregation, the repetition of the Amidah was considered the perfect time for the men to catch up on news with each other. When Baruch first moved into this community, he tried not to become involved in this talk, but he soon realized that his new neighbors considered him a holier than thou person. So the first time that he spoke during the Chazan's repetition of the Amidah, he felt within him a burning guilt for doing so. But by the end of the first month of partaking in the chatter, he was initiating the conversations himself. The period of Elul through Yom Kippur is especially equipped for our teshuva to succeed. But nonetheless, the optimal time to do teshuva is ASAP right now, immediately after you have done the sin. When we view our efforts to do teshuva as solidifying our relationship with God, our resolve to do teshuva is most effective. Don't let it become repetitive over time and become something that you don't even feel any remorse for. For example, here's a story we've all gone through. Gentlemen, a newlywed husband sits down to a dinner with his young wife that she has prepared. He takes a bite of the chicken coated in an unusual sauce, not the one his mother used to use, and says, hmm, this is kind of interesting. Immediately, his wife's smile collapses and her eyes seem a little moist. 
Oh no, I've insulted her, the man thinks. On the spot, he looks her in the eye and he says, my apologies, that was a foolish thing for me to say. This is delicious. What I meant to say is I've never had something this delicious before in my life. True story, ne? <laughs> it will be a true story. Nati, it will be a true story. <laughs> when a person's heart is devoted to another person, he responds instantaneously to anything that he thinks might cloud the relationship. As soon as you hurt someone you love, you don't wait until next month to fix the problem. You fix it immediately. So by hastening to do teshuva immediately after a sin, we show God that we are his devoted, beloved people, and that we cannot endure even for a moment any distance between us. So what did we say a few weeks ago? When, uh, the, uh, what was his name again? I think it was Rabbi Yoshua asked Elijah, when's Messiah going to come? And he asked Messiah, when's Messiah going to come? What was the answer? Today. Today. Remember, we spoke about Neil Diamond. Ayom, ayom, ayom. That is when we should repent. He will come today if you heed his voice. So those are the 10 strategies. Let's recap them. Strategy number one, make sure you are going the right way. Learn how to do Teshuvah by studying the laws of Teshuvah and make sure that you've got Yeshua at the front of your mind when you're doing uh, Yeshua, Yeshua at the front of your mind when you're doing Teshuvah. Strategy number two, take small steps. You can't do it all at once. One thing at a time. I heard a story this week of a tightrope walker who uh, they asked him, how do you not fall from these high rise buildings when you walk across that rope? He says, because my eyes are focused on the goal on the other side. As soon as I lose my focus, I'll fall down. So make sure we're taking small steps, but make your focus the messianic era. Strategy number three, increase your yira shamayim, your fear of heaven. Recognize God's hand, even in the misfortune that comes your way. Strategy number four, make it real. Now, it needs to be more than head knowledge. You need to believe these things in your heart, and then it will move you to the shuba. Strategy number five, damage control. Remember that your sins multiply and have a ripple effect. It makes bigger and bigger and bigger. It becomes a snowball. So when you repent, you can also repent of all those things and those will get wiped away as well. Strategy number six, study Musar, spiritual ethics. Every night when you go to bed for the next few days, take an accounting of your soul. Strategy number seven, focus on the negative. Be legitimate about your self-judgment. You're not only human. You're a magnificent human being who can choose to do the right thing. Strategy number eight, Accept the responsibility, who, me? You chose to do that sin. Don't blame it on anyone else. Strategy number nine, pray, because the gates of prayer are open in these 10 days. Be proactive with your teshuva. Strategy number 10, ASAP right now. Repent right away, because then it becomes a habit to repent, and it doesn't become a habit to sin. So the more we plan, the more we prepare, practice, the more beautiful our symphony of Teshuvah will sound as we seek to merit life and blessing. By applying any or all of these 10 strategies, we can fulfill the blessings of the Amidya that says, bring us back our father to your Torah, bring us near our king to your service and influence us to return in perfect repentance before you. And by using these strategies, I have no doubt that we will all be written, inscribed and sealed in the book of life. Shabbat shalom. Sorry, I lost my calendar. <laughs>